you can go to school and go to university, get your degrees and get your job, and that can be all planned and, and everything falls into place, but the sport isn't like that. You have to take the rough with the smooth, and, and most times in sport, there's a lot more rough than there is smooth. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, whose bucket list includes being on the cover of a magazine, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 20 of the Running For Real podcast. I am so excited that you are here right now. Thank you so much for choosing to listen to Running For Real. I know there's a hundred other things you could be doing with your time, so I really appreciate that you are here right now. So before I begin with this week's episode, last week we had a different Steve, my husband and coach, And we had a great discussion, which I hope you enjoyed. If you haven't listened to it, make sure you go back. We talked about, you know, training philosophies, mistakes runners usually make and how to avoid them. And finally, his thoughts on our rather drastic life changes in the last six months, be me going from a professional runner to not running to being pregnant. And so he talked about that and I hope you enjoyed that episode. This week we have Steve Jones, who is an absolute legend in the running world. You know, he broke the world record on his first attempt at the marathon. He's finished eighth in uh, the 10K at the Olympics. He is known as the king of pain or described as like an animal with the way he approached his races. And you will see why in this episode. It really is just an eye-opening episode. I think you're really going to enjoy it and kind of see that For him, it's just simple the way that we should be going out there and kind of just doing our best rather than letting all these numbers and this technology kind of bring us down and make us overcomplicate things. So we're going to talk about his career. We're going to talk about his coaching, what he would have done differently if he ever thinks he pushed too hard, which you'll be interested to hear the result, and why he never wears a watch or wore a watch and why that actually helped him to run better. This is a great story. I know you're going to enjoy it. And if you do enjoy the episode, could I ask you a favor? Would you mind reviewing this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher or whoever else you listen? Those reviews do so much for me in climbing up the iTunes rankings. I haven't really had many reviews lately and it would really help me if you could do that. So if you do, thank you so much in advance. And thank you for visiting the sponsor pages for all of you who have visited You Can or Get V. Both those companies are supporting the Running For Real podcast and I am so thankful to them. And by you visiting their pages, that helps support me too. Thank you so much. Let's get on with the interview. Smoothies, recovery bowl, bars, cookies, biscotti. What do all of those have in common? Any ideas? You can make them with Generation You Can. How's that for a win-win? Learn more about Generation You Can at generationyoucan.com and I will give you a coupon code later in the episode for 10% off. Steve, thank you so much for joining me on the Running For Real podcast. You are someone I've wanted to have on for a while and thankfully our mutual friend Sarah set this up so I could finally have you on, but I'm excited for you to be here today. It's nice to be here. Thanks, Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you to Sarah. So I want to kind of go over your entire story. You know, we've got so much to discuss and people will love hearing about you and learning things from you that I know that this is particular areas they struggle with, but I want to go right back to the beginning. So you started off as a corporal in the British Air Force. And I was just wondering, firstly, do you think that played any part in like developing the toughness that you became known for? Or do you think that was just ingrained in you, kind of almost in your DNA before that? Well, I mean, if you want to go right back to the beginning, then you have to go back to 1970 when I was just a 15-year-old. Yeah. Just on the side, uh, the, the corporal in the RAF part was where I actually was at the time I broke the world record in 1984 for the marathon. But it really started back in 1970 when I was in the Air Training Corps, which is like a cadet service for, for youngsters mm-hmm. before joining the military and at 15 I was persuaded to run in a cross-country race and mm-hmm. my first ever run was a cross-country race so I enjoyed it and I finished fifth I qualified for the next round of that particular cross-country series and uh, 
went from strength to strength. I only trained, but actually I didn't train. Like I said, my first ever run was was a race, and my next run was a race, and my next run was a race. So I, I raced about five times, six times a year, mm-hmm. but I never trained until I joined the Air Force at, at 18 and a half. So you wouldn't do any running in between? It was just completely your races, and then it was just, were you doing any other sports or anything else in between? Well, well as kids, uh, you know, there wasn't so much traffic on the road, so we were always playing football or rugby or cricket mm-hmm. or something in the street. And... Back uh, in South Wales, in Abbeville, where I grew up, uh, we were right on the mountains. So we could, we could we'd be up there playing cowboys and Indians or war or whatever, mm-hmm. running away from each other, playing mm-hmm. tag. Uh, so th- there was plenty of exercise to be had. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just wasn't an organized um, sports games or sports uh, events. So, you mm-hmm. know, we picked our own football teams, our own soccer, uh, rugby teams, cricket teams. So, you know, it, it, and it was all outside school. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we never wanted to be in the house, even if it was raining. It was like, "Mom, can we go out? Can we go out? You know, maybe up the mountain or straight away, you know, whether it's fishing or whether it's playing war games or whatever. Yeah. So exercise was, uh, um, was a way of release, I suppose, you know, mm-hmm. but today it's all mental with games and technology. Our uh, release was going out and running around the mountains. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing to think about how much things have changed. You know, like you said, now, you know, kids don't really get out too much. And if they do, it's more of the formal kind of structured training, like you said, yours definitely was not. And speaking of that, like you, this might be a hard question to answer, but have you ever thought about whether you think you would have done as well as you did? Had you been, you know, someone picked you up and said, okay, you need to start training. You obviously have talent here. Let's put you in this training. Do you think you would have done well or do you think you would have ended up struggling in the long run because you just, you know, your body wasn't ready for serious training and instead just having fun? That's a tough question. I don't Mm -hmm. really know. You know, um, I think, you know, history shows and tells what I did and how I did it. Um, Would it have been any different if it was in the third millennium instead of 1970s i don't know mm. you know it's tough to say mm-hmm. I, I i really didn't have a structure to my training or to, or to yeah to my training and my running and racing until 1976 which is six years after i started running mm-hmm. and racing and then you know the structure came with a guy that did come up knocked on my door and asked me if he could coach me you know mm-hmm. he was the captain of my art of my Station cross country team. Uh, I trained with him every day, as did uh, ten other guys. The station captain. He was the best runner on the on the camp, and you know whatever he was doing, then we would do. Mm-hmm. And so, and, did you work with him all the way up to when you kind of decided to coach yourself? You know, when you were, I guess, officially an elite, or was he someone that worked with you most of your running life? Bob and I worked together from 1976 to 1984. So that's eight years of a good progressive incremental increase of mileage and, and pace and workout sessions in that eight years you know mm-hmm. and he got me from being a b team runner on my station at RAF Lynham to an olympic 10,000 meter final mm-hmm. and he, we did it, it progressively you know it was and it wasn't technology it wasn't science it was just running every day yeah which is you know at the end of the day what it comes down to rather than adding all the complications which we're going to talk about that a bit in a minute because yeah, yeah. I actually very much agree with you in the you know overuse of technology and how we have forgotten how to listen to our bodies but anyway before we go on to that so in 1983 you went from being very successful in the 5k 10k and decided you know you wanted to try a marathon and um Whatever I've read about you, it kind of seems like that was a bit of a like sporadic jump and people were kind of like, oh, what, you know, what, what's going on? And you did go back to do the 10K in the Olympics, as you mentioned. But was the marathon decision kind of something that seemed like a good idea at the time? Kind of like almost a why? Well, why not? Or was it that you were waiting for the right opportunity and Chicago just happened to offer that? Um, a bit of everything, really. Uh, obviously, I was waiting for the right opportunity. Um I really needed to get the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics out of the way. Mm-hmm. There was no way I was going to attempt to try and run a marathon there because I felt I was in a good position and a strong position in the 10K rankings to, to perform well in in the 10,000. So, mm-hmm. But I had a, a bit of a stellar year on the track in 1983. I think I ran five or six 10Ks under 28 minutes wow. and made 
played the final of the, the first world championships in Helsinki in the 10,000. And whilst I was there, a guy called Bob Wright, who was a race director for Chicago Marathon, asked me through an agent I was working with here in America, Bob Woods, asked if I uh, wanted to attempt uh, Chicago Marathon. And I thought, well, why not? You know, mm-hmm. Helsinki was over. And there was going to be you know, almost two months between Helsinki 10,000 meter final and uh, the Chicago Marathon. But what what sold me the deal to me was the fact that he was going to fly uh, my wife and my two children with me oh, wow. to Park City for three weeks to train before coming to to Chicago. So it was really an opportunity to take the family away after all the sacrifices that they made that year for me to race so well and then go to the World Championships. Yeah, to go to America, have a nice time uh, in Park City at altitude, and then go on to Chicago. So. Yeah, the, that opportunity came around and, and I grabbed it with both hands. Mm-hmm. Saying that, Patricia uh, Owen, who was working for Chicago, uh, for New York Marathon at the time, chatted to me in, in Helsinki and asked me if I would be interested in running New York. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, you know, I kind of committed to uh, Chicago, but this is what the deal they're offering me. And like I said, it was four tickets basically for me and my family and yep. three, three weeks in Chicago and, and in Park City, and she said, well, we can't do that. I said, okay. So I didn't go to New York that year. I went to Chicago. <laughs> and Chicago was, um, I was running really well going into Chicago. I trained pretty hard in Park City. I was training with Hugh Jones. Uh, mm-hmm. We both had the same agent, Bob Woods, and um, who lived in Salt Lake City. So he was only a little bit away. And even Hugh said that I was running very well. And I should race well. And people have been telling me for about three or four years before that, that, hey, Jonesy, when you decided to run a marathon, you run fantastic, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, I got to Chicago and it didn't quite work out the way I wanted to. I went for a run the night before the race, just 20, 25 minutes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it felt great. Got back to the hotel and as I was walking in the door, Hugh Jones was coming out and he was going out for 20 minutes. So I said, okay, I'll come with you then. And during that 20 minutes, something happened in my foot and uh, tendon or ligament uh, just cramped up and, and I couldn't walk. Next morning, I put my shoe on as tight as I could to try and alleviate the pain a little bit and started the marathon. I got to 16 miles and I, I was just hobbling. Mm-hmm. So I decided I had to pull out. Yeah, and obviously the the right decision. And did you like tweak it at, during that run or did it yeah, kind of come I did, up I did something and it, stay, it stayed with me for about six weeks I think you know oh. I, I just couldn't shake it off so mm-hmm. I, may, I maybe just aggravated a ligament in my in the top of my foot there yeah yeah that was frustrating but you were able to despite that time and despite that setback you were able to come back and finish eighth in the 1984 Olympic 10k which was you know an amazing turnaround and great comeback did you notice a, a difference uh, in the way you felt in your 10K with the endurance that you got through the marathon training? Well, funny you should say that because I, I never actually changed my training. Oh, really? Because I feel as a, as a world, world-class 10,000 meter runner that you'd run in 10K, 10 mile training anyway, mm-hmm. 95% of the time. So you're always on that edge of, you know, of moving into marathon kind of training. So I... I uh, didn't change things very much. Maybe the last six weeks leading into sh- into Chicago in 1984, mm-hmm. I tried to pick up a little bit more mileage. But I had three races in that. Se- uh, this time I went for six weeks to train in Park City. I had three races, I think, during that six weeks before Chicago. So it was a bit up and down, you know, a little inconsistent mm-hmm. in terms in terms of the days I did certain things. But it was consistent in the mileage I was doing and the workouts I was doing. Mm-hmm. Well, well, that's even more impressive then. And, uh, you know, your first marathon that you did end up completing, you ended up running a world record, which, you know, blew everyone away. And then you won London, New York, Toronto, finished second in Boston, you know, incredible results for for anyone to run. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there's plenty out there about those particular successes, but I kind of want to dive deeper into things today and give you some questions that maybe people haven't asked. And one thing about one of your races, I can't remember which one it was, that you had to stop to go to the bathroom and you still, you know, ran very well. And it was either the first or second that you finished. So a lot of runners listening, you know, have had issues with 
their stomachs or having to go to the bathroom in races. And it's very hard not to let it destroy you mentally. So how did you, when you had to go to those bathroom stops, how did you not let that affect you and pull you back and think, oh, well, this is over? I was committed committed to the race. Uh, it was actually London Marathon in 1985. Okay. And, you know, there'd been quite a big build up pre-race between Char, Charlie Spedding and myself. And I just ate something the day before the race that upset my stomach. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons it was something I, I don't usually eat. Uh, so one of the things I don't always tell people is that don't try and do anything different mm-hmm. or eat anything different the day before or two days before or even the morning of the race, because it'll catch you out most times in, you know, somewhere during the race. Mm-hmm. Well, it uh, started bothering me about four miles and, you know, I, my stomach was cramping up. I, you know, I knew I was pinching the cheeks a little bit and I just struggled on, I suppose, you know, there was mm-hmm. lots going on in the race. So it could t- it took my focus off my own condition, you know, watching, you know, how Charlie was running, how Christoph Hiller was running, mm-hmm. Alistair Hutton, you know, there was a nice group of us running uh, or racing around the streets at that, at that particular moment. So I, I put it out of my mind for a couple of miles, miles and then I'd get another water stop and I'd grab some more water and then, you know, as you drink and you relax your stomach and then things start uh, working overtime again. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I, I was just focused on the job in hand. Uh, okay. and, and I'll come back to that in just a second is that we got to 22 miles, I think, and it was just Charles and I. And I turned to Charles. I said, Charles, I, my stomach is terrible. I need to go to the bathroom. What should I do? And Charles, you know, in his dry humor, just looked at me and said, stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we got to... Um, the Tower Hotel, which is like 23 yep. miles, 23 and a half miles, I think. 22. And just running past the Tower of London, I just pulled off to the side and went to the bathroom. Charlie thought, Charlie must have thought, um, I t- you know, I've got this now. Yeah, Where the yeah, hell yeah. is he? Mm-hmm. And of course, it, if you watch it on TV, the TV's, the people on TV are going crazy. Yeah. Oh, Jones has blown up. Jones has done this. He's holding his hamstring. Well, you know, I did what I needed to do. Fortunately, they were there wasn't very many people around at that particular point mm-hmm. because it's fairly narrow. So I think yeah. they tried to keep people out of uh, that, that middle. It was when you actually went around the Tower Hotel and through mm-hmm. past the Tower of London. So there wasn't many people there. Not me. I think somebody did get some pictures, but they've never really surfaced. And the TV cameras are off me just at that split second. Mm-hmm. Well, within 250 yards, I'd caught Charlie back up and wow. then it was head to head again then. But, the thing I was going to come back to, Tina, is that when you're running well, especially in that sort of situation, and it's head to head with uh, yourself and the next best guy, and you're trying to win the race, those things don't really bother you very much. Mm-hmm. But in a different scenario, a different situation, if I hadn't been running well, then I might have just said, you know, I've had enough of this, I'm going to go to the bathroom and I'll just kind of jog in. Kind of mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm. So it depends on how you're running. Okay. It's like when you run a really great race, you're not sore the next day. Mm-hmm. But if you have a bad race, then you can hardly walk, get walked mm-hmm. down the stairs. Yeah, always the way. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for, for that. And that, that is helpful for anyone listening. Like, you know, it, it's not necessarily the end of it. And um, if you do have to stop and you can always get it back, but you have to kind of want to and have to be prepared to reset your mind. So hopefully that was helpful. And I have to ask, out of all the marathons, which was your favourite? Oh, it's hard to say, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think... Sometimes your favorite isn't isn't the race where you've run particularly fast or mm-hmm. or you've you've just gone because it's a fantastic race. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've run Catalina Marathon mm. on Catalina Island uh, nine times. I've never run faster than four thirty, but just being there with my friends, mentoring people around the course, running back and forth, joking with them, you know, that's probably the most enjoyable running of my whole running career. Yeah. Uh, if you're talking about success and uh, reward, I suppose, then the five marathons I've won were all good. You know, maybe that London one was holds a special place. One because it is in the UK, it mm-hmm. was at home. I was taken on Olympic bronze medalist and the race favourite in Charlie, and uh, I was actually coaching myself at, at that time. Mm-hmm. Bob and I had parted you know, parted ways in 1984. And I coached myself through to it 1986. So to do it my way and mm-hmm. and get the result that I went to, went there to get uh, was very pleasing. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can imagine. And and I take it the press were going crazy that you you won that despite that stop and kind of that was probably the first question they were all asking you, uh, like, yeah. what were you doing? <laughs> yeah, and I think as soon as I finished uh, crossed the finish line, and somebody asked me, uh, "Did you have to stop to spend a penny?" And I just said, well, it's "More like a pound." <laughs> <laughs> so, and everybody laughed. Then. And of course, because I had I admitted it, nobody's ever really let it go. Mm. Very few people have the the whole story correct. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, they know I went to the bathroom. They know it was in London, but they never actually know where it was because when I caught Charlie a mile later we went under into Blackfriars Tunnel and uh, we went in together and I came mm-hmm. out 10 seconds ahead of him mm-hmm. so everybody thinks I did something in there <laughs> and, shot, and shot away from Charlie but uh, all I did was um, responded to a come on Jonesy before I went in the tunnel and came out with a you know a slight lead and worked on that to the finish line yeah no amazing to hear and very inspiring and uh I don't think you would have got away with that in this day and age with uh, the amount of smartphones and how, you know, London is just lined from Yeah, it'd be, it'd point be to viral, point. wouldn't it? Yes, you would have. So lucky it happened when it did. But um, <laughs> thankfully it did. Okay, so you were given the nickname the King of Pain. So maybe I thought you could tell us firstly where that came from or who first gave you that. And do you like that nickname or is it something that makes you laugh but you can't really you know, see that you, you deserve it any more than anyone else? I think the latter, I think. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know that I am the king of pain. Uh, a friend and I, a couple of friends and I designed a, a circuit that we used to do in the gym at, when I was at RAS St. Athens back in the early 80s. And I nicknamed that circuit the House of Pain because mm-hmm. it did hurt, you know, uh, for the first two, three weeks that we did it. And uh, and as we increased the, the amount of effort, so the amount of uh, reps, we got used to it, but it hurt. And lots of people would uh, try and come in and join us on one-offs, you know, international boxers, rugby players, mm-hmm. soccer players, weightlifters even, that they only stayed one or two workouts and not one or two weeks because we used to do it three times a week, but one or two workouts and then they'd had enough. Mm-hmm. But the pain thing, I'm, I'm just not sure where that came from. I, I, I always trained hard. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was reading an article where I spotted a headline of an article uh, just yesterday about how to manage your threshold runs. I run threshold all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I learned that very quickly. And, and you know, whereas now it's a, it's a specific workout. I did it every day. Mm-hmm. You know, so I trained hard. And when I raced, I wherever it was, it was in UK, US, in Europe. When the gun went, I always went off hard. Whether it was cross country, whether it was road, or whether it was on the track, I always gave it a hundred percent. And people, especially the Europeans, you know, in Italy and Portugal, you know, they used to call me the fox because as soon as the gun went, I was, I was always at the front, and <laughs> everybody was chasing me. So maybe that's you know my work ethic was second to none, I, I believe. Mm-hmm. I'm, sure, I'm sure we all believe that in our own little worlds, in our, in our own lunchtimes. But, you know, Bob Wallace, my first coach, the greatest compliment he ever gave me throughout my running career was that I had an insatiable appetite for hard work, mm-hmm. which I think amazed him. And I think it spoiled him a little bit because I don't think he, he never got his hands on anybody with my my disposition, I suppose. Yeah, well, and I think also, you know, the the way your body was able to handle that high intensity training, especially without even all the the rehab, the recovery, all those little things that we have now that you know are supposed to help us with recovering faster. Do you think that you you just are very lucky in that you were able to handle that, or was there something specific that you feel like made a difference with you to allow your body to be able to handle running at like you said threshold pace every day? I, I, as I said, um, when Bob first started coaching me, and the next eight years, everything was progressive. You know, we we didn't just jump in uh, in at the deep end straight away. Mm-hmm. You know, going from sixty miles a week to sixty five, seventy miles a week. You know, and those incremental increases and small increases year in, year out, year in, year out, helped me develop that strength. You know, yes. I've been physical all my life. All my jobs and all my work has been physical work, you know, whether it's lifting tires or wheels or wings or, mm-hmm. or tools. And I've always been outdoorsy. I've always run around the mountains and been out in the cold and, you know, just weathered myself mm-hmm. 
in, in all that time has been in preparation for the end result. Although nobody knew what the end result was going to be, it was my imprint, I suppose, or my, it was my, I can't think of the word, it was, it was my destiny, I suppose. Yeah, you know, yeah. Everything I did, but I never thought about it. Mm -hmm. it, it just, it just came. Mm -hmm. You know, even when I first started running for uh, Swindon AC, when I joined Swindon and, and the RAF lineup, it wasn't about trying to win the races. It wasn't about trying to be a superstar. I just wanted to beat that SOB in front of me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was one step at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, I never had big dreams. I never dreamt I was going to run in the Olympics. I never dreamt I was going to break a world record. I never dreamt I'd run 27.39 for 10K. I just kept trying and trying. And I was never disappointed. That's yeah, I've had disappointed races. But I've never been disappointed in my career or, or the places I've been and the, and the things I've done. Mm-hmm. Well, that's wonderful and, and real different perspectives for us to hear, but such a good one for us to hear. Because do you think now then, um, you know, nowadays when people race, they put too much, like we're so spoiled and like in cotton wool all the time with the rest of our lives and the way we can get all these treatments and extra things that we put too much pressure on, like you said, you didn't even have, you know, I want to do this, I want to do that, but we, you just kind of did your best and, uh, you know, let the result take care of itself. Do you think that's anything to do with why we kind of struggle now? Because it's such an extreme difference to like the rest of our lives where we are just floating along in a comfortable state. Yeah, um, I, I, I think you can go to school and go to university, get your degrees and get your job and, and that can be all planned and, and, and everything falls into place, but the sport isn't like that. You know, you have to take the rough with the smooth. And, and most times in sport, there's a lot more rough than there is smooth. Mm -hmm. Back in the 70s, I finished seventh, 1976, I finished seventh in the Welsh Cross Country Championships. The World Championships was, was going to be held in Wales that year. And I didn't get picked. There's nine people on the team and five reserves, and I still didn't get picked. So I said, next year, they have to pick me. I didn't say what I was going to do. I, I just said, you know, wherever I finished, it was going to be in a position where they had to pick me after the championships. Mm -hmm. Well, the next next year, I won. Mm -hmm. So obviously, that was a goal I set myself, not to win the race, but to be in that team. And, you know, I probably raced from that February to the next February. From February 76 to February 77, I probably raced 50, 60 times. Wow. I never missed anything. And any, any races I could get into, I, I loved it. I loved running from a unit. I love running for my club. And I even at the end of 76, I got a couple of cross-country races, like in Gateshead cross-country race mm -hmm. for my country. I never missed an opportunity. If somebody's dangled a race in front of me, I grabbed it with both hands. Mm -hmm. In the same vein, the prima donnas, I suppose, it's, it's, they're my friends, I shouldn't really call them prima donnas, mm -hmm. but the, the more established elite runners in Wales at that time they wouldn't come out to a Gwent League or they wouldn't come out to a Wales versus RAF or they wouldn't go out and run on the roads because i I got to get ready for the Welsh Cross Country Championships. i got to get ready for Welsh Cross Country mm -hmm. cross Championships. And they'd never made a team in the end. And they missed all those opportunities to go out and enjoy themselves, you know, visit new, new cities, new towns, race against new competition because they set their mind on, I, I want to make the World Cross Country team. Mm -hmm. So I'm saving myself for the, World Championship, uh, for the Welsh Championships. Well, like I said, in the end, they had a crappy race in the Welsh Championships. They never made the team. Yeah. Whereas I made the team and I enjoyed, I had a fantastic year of racing as well. Mm -hmm. I think that happens more often than we realise as well, where we turn things down and then, you know, really that would have been the better opportunity and it would have taken that, that pressure off to um, perform on that particular day. So. Yep. I'm glad you shared this because I think this is helpful for a lot of people listening and, um, you know, especially the recreational runners who are thinking about doing extra events mm -hmm. with friends, but not really sure because they have a goal race coming up. So, And the other thing is, this racing and, and running, it gets to be more than a hobby, although back in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, it, it was just a hobby. But, um, you know, you don't learn anything just going out and training every day. Mm -hmm. you, you, get, you get into these races, you know, clash you know, get spiked a few times, the elbows and, 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 and how to cope with the stresses of a race, yep. whether it's a short six-mile cross-country race or whether it's a 10-mile road race. Things go wrong. How do mm -hmm. I cope with that? You know, learning or stress, distance running is about coping with stresses. Yeah. You know, and, and unless you put yourself in that situation, then you're never going to learn. Mm -hmm. And then when it happens in a race, you shrug your shoulders, put your arms in the air and just say, WTF, you know. Mm -hmm. 
no, I completely agree with you. And and that's also when people ask me, which they quite often do about running on their treadmill um, every day, you know, I try and say, okay, that's fine. But you, you're, you're wrapping yourself in this situation in cotton wool where when something goes wrong in a race, you have no, because you've, you know, stayed inside because it's windy or it's hot or it's cold. You've made it so that if that happens in your race, you have no idea what to do because you have kind of, uh, right avoided all the situations. So I think there's a lot that can be taken from what Steve is saying here. So make sure you take a listen to this and maybe pause it on your run, write some notes and then um, continue on. So one more thing I want to ask you about this uh, King of Pain before we move on to the part I am really excited to hear about, because we definitely agree on this part, is people listening, you know, you did manage to push yourself. You said you were called the Fox. You said you pushed hard from the start. For someone who is listening and saying, you know, I really struggle to push myself. I find it hard when I'm in that tough point in the race to keep trying. So do you have any advice or is it something that you believe you're either just kind of born with that grit or, you know, can it be developed? It's a talent, I suppose. Uh, and not to say I'm a talented person, but but um, I would say for the most part, that the, 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 the people, that uh, the audience that we're talking to anyway, is that you, you are probably pushing yourself too, too hard at that particular moment and you're not prepared well enough to get past that stage. And the way you get prepared for that is in your training. You know, Maybe look at something in your training, mm -hmm. maybe something different, because sometimes the same old, same old doesn't always work. And you need that injection of something different, whether it's uh, uh, more quality work, more mileage, uh, less mileage. Just monitor yourself a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean, you know, waking up thinking I'm tired, I'm not going to do the workout today or I'm not going to practice today. It's a habit you do get into. And if you overanalyze it too much, then you're just fighting a losing battle because if you analyze one thing and it doesn't work and you analyze another thing, it doesn't work and you've just overanalyzed yourself out of the race completely and, mm -hmm. and your comfort, confidence goes. Mm -hmm. But usually if, if you practice it in training, you're confident in what you can do. Don't overestimate what your abilities. And, and that's for the most part, that's what you, usually happens. And that's why you get in that situation because you've got, you have gone off too hard or you are trying to overreach or overstride. And uh, it's just come a bit new in the backside. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's great to, you, you mentioned that. And I think people can take from that. You know, you might think that you're just, you're mentally giving up, but I think he's right in saying that it probably isn't that you're mentally giving up, but your body isn't prepared for that. The same way people get cramps, you know, around, mile 20 and they say oh it's because mm -hmm. of electrolytes well usually it's not it's usually the lack of training that has prepared you for that moment and then one more thing do you ever feel in any race or any training or anything that you pushed yourself too hard no no okay I don't think you can I don't know though because <laughs> I I did my first marathon I believe I pushed myself too hard I don't remember anything about the last three miles I couldn't even see straight I didn't even know my name and uh you know I fell across the finish line they took me off on a stretcher and I don't know like for me that scared me because I I feel like I had checked out and my body was just on autopilot so for me You're that so was a bit too scary but I was just curious if you had any moments like that where you thought maybe it was too much or not it's like touching the void isn't it mm -hmm. you never really know mm. until it actually happens to you I mean mm -hmm. you could look at my run in the European Championships in 1986, where I had a two-minute lead at halfway, and I finished last but one in the race. Mm -hmm. uh, did I push myself too hard? Uh, some would say. But, you know, there was something missing. You know, it's like making a cake. There's something missing in uh, the, the preparation of uh, yeah. the cake before in the oven. And mine was that I was dehydrated before the start of the race. Mm -hmm. I had trained in Falmouth on on the Cape for six weeks prior to going to Stuttgart for the world champ, uh, the European Championships in '86, I was running really well. I trained really hard in uh, Cape Cod, and when I went back to Wales prior to flying out to Stuttgart, but um, I was already hydrated before I got, uh, dehydrated before I got there. Mm -hmm. I made a poor decision not to have any water out on the course, my own bottles. I mean, uh, although I was being advised to by my team management, uh, British team manager, Gordon Surdies. Uh, I said, no, you know, I, if you have to remember, it was still only my fourth marathon. So I, so I was still a novice mm -hmm. and I'd never had my own water in the previous three and I'd won those. So why change anything? Yeah, yeah. 
So I didn't have, because in the previous year, I'd just grab a cup of water or, or something off the bystander, you know, where they have the water tables. Well, I got to the first water station and I was just in the front, I think, at 5K. I grabbed a cup of water off of somebody that was holding one out and it was uh, like Perrier water. It was fizzy water. Huh. It all fizzed up in my mouth, so I spat it out and I threw it to the ground and I decided I wasn't going to try and take any. So I didn't drink then for the rest of the race. At halfway, I was two minutes in front. Uh, and a couple of K later, I was only a minute in front. And a couple of K later, I was almost last. And I finished last but one. It was my mistake. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I overdid it. But it was a mistake. It wasn't because my body gave up. Or I did, you know, I, I wasn't prepared enough. It was because I made a stupid decision not to take take water. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And I've never thought about it that way, but that that is very true, you know. And usually when something like that happens, like what you went through, then there was something missing mm-hmm. in, Absolutely. in your preparation. Absolutely. Yeah. No, and I, I couldn't agree more. I, th- I think that is the case. And I actually didn't drink anything after mile 15. So that was partly my fault as well. Um, <laughs> well, it was completely my fault, but I mean, that was part to blame. But yeah, okay. That was great. Really, really helpful there. So one thing I wanted to discuss with you, you know, I don't go quite to the extreme of never wearing a watch, but I am all about not looking at it. People who listen to this podcast regularly who know me say that I talk about no watch me, where you don't look at your watch, you run by feel, you let your body trust you. But what was the reason for you of not even wearing a watch? Or why did you think, you know, you didn't even want to have it with you to kind of look through afterwards? Because... Uh, I probably didn't have a watch. Um, <laughs> no, my philosophy, my coach's philosophy, both of my coaches' philosophies, um, they were the only ones that had held a watch. Mm-hmm. But my training has always been effort-based. Yeah, It's effort-based. Uh, if I trained by myself or did a workout by myself, then obviously I'd have a watch on if it was like four times five minutes or, or eight times three minutes or ten times three minutes, and I'd need to know when to stop and when, mm-hmm. and when to start. And that's the only reason I used a watch. Mm-hmm. Back then, we didn't have garments or polar or um, sophisticated watches. It was just a, a stopwatch, stop and go. Mm-hmm. So th- that's the only time I'd wear a watch. Uh, why, would you, why would I want to wear a watch in training, you know, in racing, sorry, especially in a marathon? Yeah. You look at the watch every 20, every mile, you're looking at it 26 times, it would drive you crazy. So, <laughs> and yes, it does uh, drive people crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, because my, my, my training was always effort-based, I didn't need to know how fast I was going. I didn't need to know how far I was going. I just I just knew it. I needed to know when to start and when to stop. Mm-hmm. And why do you feel that's so effective when it comes to racing? For someone listening who is kind of addicted to their Garmin, what makes this so effective? Because you're racing other people. You're not racing your watch. Mm-hmm. You're racing the distance. You're not racing your watch. You're racing 10K or 5K or half marathon, 10 miler. And the... 13,000 other people running side by side with you. You're racing those people. It can be stressful doing that. Mm -hmm. But but to me, it's more stressful having this thing on the end of your arm telling you how fast you're going or how slow you're going. Exactly. No, I I completely agree. And um, you're like this, uh, Steve. I actually have created, my husband and I, who was my coach, created a training plan, a a marathon, half marathon, 5K and 10K plan, 100% effort-based. There is no paces we do have distances like miles per day and stuff, but no mm-hmm. paces, no training volume specifics. It is just an effort out of 10 for each day of how you know hard to run and how, how to progress. And it's been doing very well. And people who have really got on board with it have really enjoyed it. So, you know, I know that's something that you'll be on board with. And I know yeah. you have athletes yourself who you coach, and I'm sure you've had quite a few of them over the years who have really struggled or maybe you refuse to have them on if they won't take it on but have you had people um you've had to try and convince that it's the right way to train rather than their watch oh i think um today's runners it's a full-time job trying to convince them they (laughs) they don't need their their heart rate monitors or their garments or any other kind of scientific technology to be able to run and to be able to run hard you know sometimes they say well how hard do you want these i I said i want them hard you know hard is 100 percent I do allow them to wear their watches now. Um, half of them are girls, and I, I don't want to fight five girls at, uh, <laughs> at any given point. But if I see them looking at their watch all the time, then I just hold my hand out and they hand it over. Mm-hmm. 
you know, I, I could be cycling next to them or standing next to them in the middle of a field and they run by and I could say 30 seconds to go and they'll look at their watch straight away. As if like, I don't trust him. <laughs> yep, yep. But, you know, I, I just like to give them a, some kind of uh, uh, indication of how long they've got to go or, or you know, when the whistle's going to blow. Yeah. So then if you're going to say about effort and, you know, you tell them I want it hard, like 100%, how do you get across to them the balance between, you know, sprinting as fast as you possibly can and holding, you know, a pace that you can, that's going to be hard, very hard for two miles, but not going to, you know, cause them to sprint and then be like right. walking it in. Well, that's um, a suck it and see situation, isn't it? You know, you ask them to give 100% and like you say, they think 100% is right. I've got to get from here to there as fast as I can. Sprint in. You know, when, when there's, there's a rule, no sprint in. Everything is supposed to be fast, relaxed. And it's something they learn over a period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something that a, a novice could come into the team or, or just somebody moves into town and wants to join the team. It's going to take time for them to learn that, learn what their body's capable of and learn that their body's capable of more than they think it, it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not a instant philosophy that they're going to pick up. It's something they have to learn over a period of time. Yep. And if they're, if they're doing it wrong, then, then yeah, you know, it's time for the coach to put his arm around them and, uh, you know, Rolling their shoulders and, and whispering in their ears, you know, what I'm looking for, how I feel they should be doing it, try and relax a little more, you know, the kind of stuff that coaches do. Mm -hmm. Nope, that's great. And then just for anyone who is on the fence about, oh, I'm thinking I should try running by effort. I'm thinking about, you know, racing by effort, but I'm not sure. Any final words you'd like to say on that topic to convince people? Yeah, the best way to do it, I, I think, is leave your watch at home and go out and do a fartlek session. You know, back in the day, fartlek session meant, you know, running from point A to point B, mm -hmm. picking it out on a run, trying to get there fast, relaxed, and having a short recovery, and then doing another little effort. And it could be anywhere from, in my case, from 30 seconds to, to two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. And the recovery was always shorter than, than, than the effort. But that's a great way of learning. You mm -hmm. know, you're not running by a time. Okay, you run running to a, a lamppost or to a tree or to, you know, some object that uh, you know is around the corner and you just want to run fairly hard to get there. It teaches you to run, put a good effort in, mm -hmm. but you're not timing yourself. You know, since I've been here, a couple of times I've said, you know, okay, in my other group, I've said uh, that this workout is going to be a fartlek session. Uh, how long is that? You know, what kind of recovery do we get? They think that 10 times two minutes is fartlek, but it's not, you know. Fartlek is just playing with it. Just mm -hmm. go out and enjoy, enjoy trying to run fast. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. But, that, but I think that's the best way to learn yeah. how to run effort based. You know, in my time, I've blown up doing a Fartlek session. Mm -hmm. Completely blown up. Mm -hmm. and, had, and had to sort of jog, jog home. Because yeah. I've run too hard. Yeah. No. That's part of the house of pain, isn't it? So. Yeah. And so true as well. I've, I've had more than my fair share of blowing up in fartlek. So I think that really is the, the best way to, to teach yourself what you can and can't handle. So as a coach now, how do you coach differently to how you trained? Have you learned that, do you kind of use the same philosophy or what's, what's different? The philosophy is the same, effort-based. I've learned that not everybody is Steve Jones. <laughs> so I, I don't give them the kind of, exactly the kind of stuff I did. Uh, certainly not the same kind of mileage, uh, not the same amount of reps, uh, but for the, for the most part, effort-based is still effort-based, you know, however you want to dress it up. Mm -hmm. And they respond. I haven't wrapped my head around the scientific side of it. And there's many people that have come to me to be coached, can't wrap their head around the effort-based training. Mm -hmm. And no easy running really because even at threshold it should be almost easy running fast relax that's what, that's all it is mm -hmm. no the, the, the philosophy hasn't changed at all okay uh, maybe a little less mileage and maybe a little less uh, repetitions in, in the efforts but for the most part it's the same okay nope that's helpful and uh, and interesting as well I, I was always wondering about that with you and then what about changes have you seen any changes 
that are good or bad in the sport when you ran compared to now? Jeez, <laughs> we were only on here for an hour. Um, <laughs> it's hard to say, you know, the sport has changed. Mm-hmm. This concept of running and racing has changed. Um, the, the reasons people run and race has, have changed. Um, there's more participants than there is competitors. Yeah. And, and I think that's the biggest change. I think I've, I've seen a dramatic swing towards the participation part than the competitive element mm-hmm. and wanting, wanting to better yourself. Yes, most people want to better themselves. They want to run you know, a little quicker than the last half marathon or the last 10K. But it's not a driving force. You know, mm-hmm. It's more people are OCD, more, more OCD about actually going out for a run than they are about trying to improve their running. Mm. Yeah, that's very true, actually. And so then related to that, you mentioned earlier that your one of your favorite races is um, running it around the Catalina Island Marathon. And you said you've never run it faster than 4.30. So is it just you've accepted that this is how it is now and kind of been like, I'm just going to join in and have fun with it? Or is it something that you kind of almost wish, even if that meant giving away that experience of Catalina, that you you wish it could go back to just being, you know, 100% competitive all the time? Um, I mean, if I could stay 29, then I'd be out there racing against the best today. But, you know, obviously I'm not. I think when I reach like 42, 43, 44, I I, I realized that it wasn't going to be the same as it was before. My training and my racing and the results uh, Mm -hmm. that that, that I, I would have hoped I could have held on to. I gave up really easy. I didn't go down with the fight, you know, fighting and kicking and and swearing. Mm -hmm. I've always believed, and I tell people this today, it's okay not to run. It's okay not to be, not to try to be the best in the world. It's okay not to, not to, to race. I do run. I don't race, but I do run, but it's okay not to. Mm -hmm. You know, I I gave it up and I never looked back. Mm -hmm. You know, I go to. I, I still go to the races. I still go to Chicago and New York and Boston and London and uh, many races in between. But I'm not jealous. I'm not. I don't live vicariously through my athletes. I'm not a runner anymore. And how do you think you were able to do that disconnect? Because I, I know I, you know, I, I would like to think that I'm going to make a comeback someday. And I know you know, obviously through Sarah Crouch, that I have stopped running or. I'm very right. little running now. Um, and I was able to disconnect and kind of be okay with it and not really miss it too much um, during that time off. And you just said the same thing. People often ask me, so I'm just curious asking you because I don't really have a good answer. How were you able to disconnect from that and be okay with it? I just let go. I had a, an incredible career. Mm-hmm. I'm the quintessential club runner that came good. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's the best way I can say it. You know, yeah. I came from nothing, you know, no talent, no running equipment, you know, pair of Woolworths uh, mm-hmm. pimsoles, you know, to being the best in the world. Yeah. And how ca- how can I think I've missed out on something? Mm-hmm. I've I was satisfied with my running career. Yeah, I love that. I th- and I think that's the way to look at it. I was satisfied with what I did. I didn't need, uh, you know. Could I have carried on for a couple more years and struggled into my late 40s, early 50s? Yeah, prob- I probably could. But I was satisfied. I wasn't driven. I wasn't driven like uh, I was as a 25-year-old. Mm-hmm. No, I feel the same way and um, same kind of thing that I still, like I said, would like to go back someday. But it was the same thing as what you just said. You kind of leave on your own terms. So yeah rather than, like you said, burning out slowly or injuries just slowly pull you down so much that you can't barely get out for you know a mm-hmm. two-mile run. So very interesting to hear and thank you. So I'm just going to take a moment to thank our sponsor and then we will be back for the Running For Real 4. I may have stopped running, but one of my favourite sponsors still makes its way into my food every day. Generation You Can. You probably already know I'm a huge fan of You Can, No, I used it as my sole fuel source in my 236 marathon. And yes, I was a little bit scared I would bonk, but my energy levels felt exactly the same the entire way. I didn't have those ups and downs, the sugar highs and sugar lows that gels gave me. But maybe you're thinking, yeah, yeah, Tina likes you can, but what is it? 
Well, Yukan is a carbohydrate source originally created for a little boy named Jonah, who continually had low blood sugar. Years later, Yukan is a favourite amongst many elites, including everyone's favourite, Meb Kaplesky. Yukan is giving Running For Real listeners 10% off using code Running For Real. So check out generationyoucan.com for more about Yukan and learn how it can help you control your blood sugar, fuel your races, and maybe make those bottomless pit stomachs of ours be happy for just a little bit longer post run. Okay, Steve, just four more questions for you, starting with, I usually call it a unique nutrition tip, but maybe we could do, if you have a nutrition tip or maybe something unique that you used to eat or that people would find fun to hear. I tell people that I broke a world record on meat pies, (laughs) Mars bars, and (laughs) Coca-Cola. I love that. So you were definitely (laughs) not someone who was um, obsessed with clean eating and... uh, Felt the need to control every piece of food that went in your mouth then? Not, not at all. <laughs> you know, especially for marathon runners, certainly distance runners anyway, is that you have to feed the engine. Mm-hmm. And I read somewhere just recently that somebody would change their diet so they could run faster. But God knows what they were doing. They probably eating uh, salads and, and beetroot or whatever. But, <laughs> you know, I eat everything. I yeah. still eat everything. Okay, I put a few pounds on now, so... Uh, maybe I shouldn't eat quite eat eat quite so much of everything. But you know, when I was running, doing a hundred miles a week, then there was nothing I wouldn't eat. Mm-hmm. And being with a young family at that time, I ate what the family ate. There was no special preparation. There was no. There wasn't even a bowl of fruit in the house, you know, unless somebody, unless somebody was ill. Uh, <laughs> but no, it was anything and everything. You have to feed that engine. Mm-hmm. Okay. That is definitely helpful. And I think a good uh, a good reminder to us all that you have to keep eating, but you don't have to just focus on keeping all the good stuff. You can, well, I guess it is, depends what you look at it, good stuff, but some stuff that brings you joy as well as, uh, as, well as just the healthy stuff. Yeah. If you have cravings, then follow the cravings. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely been doing that pregnant, so I can... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anybody that's improved their running through changing their diet. Mm. I know people have improve their running through ch- changing their lifestyle or changing their their training but not through their diet mm-hmm. okay thank you all right um a running for real moment something that only runners will understand be it something that moment you were embarrassed or you were um that you know you were out and uh, a situation that runners would only get and non-runners would be completely confused Wanted to go to the bathroom in the middle of a race. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Yeah, we can keep that <laughs> yeah. as your uh, your uh, moment. <laughs> yeah, and and it was it was embarrassing, mm-hmm. but you know it wasn't quite as embarrassing as letting Charlie go and and Charlie winning the race. It was you know I knew Charlie couldn't beat me, so I just needed to go to the bathroom, get it out of the way, and catch him up. And you did, and you won, so definitely <laughs> worthwhile. All right, what was a high moment for you, and why did it mean so much? I think we can go all the way back to 1976 and 77, where I finished seventh in the Welsh Championships, mm-hmm. Cross Country Championships in 76, and then coming back the following year after being left out of the World Cross Country team, saying that they would have to pick me and then winning the race. Mm-hmm. It was really a, a big step forward for me. From Like I say, two years previous to that, I was a B, a B team runner at RAF Lineup. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then two years later, I'm winning my national cross country championships and proving almost like sticking two fingers up to the selectors. Although, they, as I said about some of the the elite runners, they were my friends. You know, I, I'd gotten to know them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they, we were all part of the same team. But you know, once you put those runners on, you know, put your spikes on or your flats or or your racing shoes, then then there are no friends, and it's eat or be eaten. You know. Yeah. Um, I, my philosophy was never in my whole running career to win a race by one second if I could win it by 90 seconds. Mm-hmm. You know, it was always about going hard and, and annihilation. Yep, I hear you. I felt the same way. When I was in college, I would um, I would win races by minutes sometimes and people would be like, why didn't you just kind of get ahead and then, you know, take it easy, save yourself? And I was like, uh, no, because I'm going to cross the finish line <laughs> you know, falling to my knees, be it on my own or with someone else. So um, I definitely agree with you on that philosophy. 
All right. What do you tell yourself or what did you tell yourself when you would stand on the starting line? I got to go for it. You know, like okay. I say, it's about annihilation. Uh, I never had any fear. You know, yeah, you get some little pangs of anxiety sometimes, but I was, ne- I was never afraid of anyone. I remember being running at Crystal Palace back in the 70s against Brendan Foster and mm-hmm. uh, Lassie Vera and Henry Rono, Rod Dixon in a 3,000 meter. And we got to three and a half laps, so just before three and a half laps. And the commentator goes, oh, my gosh, and, and somebody is shot off from the front, and it was me. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, this was probably 1976 or early, mid-'77, and I was a novice. And I was running as a boy amongst gi- giants that day. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I wasn't afraid of him, okay? I blew up. Uh, I, I think I ran about 8.01 in the end for 3K, but, uh, I, and I blew up mightily. But I just wanted to stick it to them. Yeah. That's pretty cool as well, knowing that, you know, that, that was probably another um, instrumental moment where you learned when you talked about effort, what you can handle and what you can't, where you need to train and change things for the next year and you know you continue to go from strength to strength from that day so yeah pretty cool and I I remember driving back from Crystal Palace that night with with my coach I didn't have a car so my coach took me everywhere and Bob goes going what were you thinking (laughs) and he was laughing as he said it you know because he he knew me he knows I'm not impatient but he knows that I I, I always want to have a go Mm -hmm. he says you know you're not quite ready for that yet you know I was (laughs) in the race and that was, you know, that was an achievement in itself, just getting into the race. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wasn't ready to take them on, but I didn't care. I just wanted to have a go. Okay. This is amazing words to hear from you and just so inspiring the way that you just, you know, like you said, go for it. It, it really is good for us to hear of, you know, not being afraid, not living in this fear that something might go wrong. So um, thank you for everything you've shared today. Now, one more thing I want to ask you. I do ask my guests to send us a photo and I've actually seen one of you in in an article before of you doing a power pose, which is where, you know, you might stand with your hands on your hips, your arms crossed and just kind of show us what you would do if you were like getting ready to go for it on the starting line to build your confidence, just so uh, runners listening can kind of try it out and see if it helps them to kind of um, feel good about themselves. Will you send me a power pose photo? Okay, I'll send you a couple and you can uh, pick what you want. Okay, he's got lots prepared. Thank you. All right, Steve, this has been amazing. Really great to uh, talk to you and hear your story. Um, Is there any way you would like people to kind of stay in touch with you? Is there a social media that you want people to follow or... Is there a best way if they want to hear more from you that they can learn more? I'm on Facebook, so okay. they can always go on Facebook and, I, and also on Twitter. So Twitter, I'm Boulder Harriers. And Facebook, I think I'm just Steve Jones, I think. Okay, I will put links in the show notes for those. Well, Steve, thank you so much. This has been great. And uh, I look forward to chatting to you again soon. Thank you, Tina. Thanks very much. You've got to love that perspective and so different to 99% of us, 99% of other guests, you know, but he's so right. We need to stop, you know, making running so complicated, adding so much to it and just, you know, do your best, learn your body and what it can do and then just go for it. Just like he said, it really is inspiring and I hope you were able to take quite a lot from this episode from, you know, someone who has done amazing things. But like he said, he came from nothing, you know, it should instill hope in all of us really. You can find everything Steve and I talked about in the show notes, which will be at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 20. And uh, I will also be putting quotes in there from Steve, other things you can do, and also um, a link to Generation You Can to get that 15% off with your uh, next purchase. I want to thank you for listening today. I know you could have spent your time a million other places, and I'm appreciative that you are here with us today. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope you have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information. 